So how did you manage to balance between your sex life, your relationship, and your poetry, and your kids? How did you manage to do that? That's interesting. My sex life, my relationship, and my kids at poetry. I mean, that's a lot. Well, I mean, there was a block of time where that where I was not doing poetry mm. or performing. Oh. There, you know, there, there was a serious block of time because at some, at one point, this was my my life was. Um, Going to work, I used to. I, I was the program director of an HIV harm reduction type of program. A very yeah. challenging. It was a very challenging job. Yeah. So, okay. I was going to graduate school as a social worker. I decided everyone, like people who I supervised, were asking me for letters of recommendation so they could go to graduate school. And I said, oh, well, why don't I go to graduate school? I mean, I didn't even get a college degree until I was like 50, you know? Love I mean, that. I, oh, yeah, I was on a 20 year plan. People talk about five. <laughs> I had 23 20 year breaks, I think, something. But anyway, so I was in graduate school at Hunter School of Social Work, which was full time, like 18 credits. So there was 18 credits. There was a, this full time job. My, my mother, who I never got along with, was, was dying of Alzheimer's and since I had to step up and supervise her care because what can you do like yeah. she was actually nicer when she had Alzheimer's than she did previously but um so there was that my son was ha was DJing like all around the world and doing speed so there was that was Ooh. yeah that that, that 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 was like a disaster my, my, my daughter was on like her fifth high school, but she was finally, <laughs> she, 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 was, she was not the biggest problem going on. And I remember one time I walked into my director's office and I sat down to ask him something and I just started sobbing hysterically because it was just like too much. So at that moment, I don't believe there was a sex life going on, right? It's just the moment that stands out to me. Yes. There, the interesting thing about it is that it did lead me back to writing because um you mean that so much was going on that you that you were you were pushed to go back to your your first love not exactly I, I wouldn't really put it that way yeah uh, certain paths I was taking opened it up to me mm. like um the day I had one day I had a huge burnout like at work which led to burnout being my master's thesis, okay? And the way they did it was you were in this small group. They would, you would divide it into these 10 groups of like 10 people and you're like randomly assigned to a professor. And once you were assigned to that professor, you could not change your group, it didn't matter. You'd have to like, you could kill yourself, you could not change your group. So they put me in this group and I walked into the group and I said, I can't work with this one yeah. in my head. And there was this guy teaching another class and for some reason I said that's my guy and I took myself to his class the next week and he was like you can't do this and I said no just give me give me a chance let me sit in your class one time one time you're gonna want me in your class and he did you know he was the guy yeah but what was the class poetry no this was the master's thesis class oh this where you could in many places get as creative as you want you had a very, it wasn't like writing you had to write the thesis but you could present it in any type of way that you wanted and the day that i burnt out at work i got i, I got in my car to go home and i started writing about it in my head oh wow so how old were you then Oh, I was old already. I was like, uh, when, I, when did I get to 50? I mean, I t took a long break, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, when you say they don't have to answer anything you don't want, I don't like talking about specific ages. Yeah, yeah. I was you already old. To. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, not as old as I am now. But <laughs> yeah, I, I finally got my master's. When did I get it? 2003, I believe. So, so it was only 20 years ago, like 20 year plan. I'm not going for a doctorate. <laughs> yeah, so 
I was already, you know. All right, I'm gonna stop. So tell me about the beginning. I, of I your... always liked writing. Yes. As a little kid, I liked writing. That was one good thing. I, I, I one thing I was good at. Yeah. My one thing I was good at. Yes. I, I wasn't that good at. I was good at reading, and I was good at writing. <laughs> you know, and um, I don't know. See, the way I grew up in the Gravesend section of Brooklyn. The arts were not something anyone ever encouraged. And I find there's a huge, huge difference between people who grew up in a way where it was acceptable yes. to be artists, to be musicians, so that where there was music in the house where you were encouraged. This was like the opposite, you know? Yeah. So it, it was that kind of thing where who, do you, who the fuck you think you are? Like yes. that's not for you, you know? Yes. So, I wound up down here anyway, but I never, I never believed in myself as an artist for many, many years. Right. And what, so one big interruption in the whole thing was a drug habit. Oh yeah. So I mean, so everything I had maybe started to do and made, because I was drawn to the artists and to the writing and to the not that there weren't drug habits going on in those circles, but you know, they, they were they were cool the places to have drug habits. Like I wasn't having my drug habits in Max's. I, I was having my drug habits like on Avenue D, you know. <laughs> so there was a whole bunch of stuff that even though I was here, I have to say I basically missed or I don't remember. And I know people joke around and say like if you remember it you weren't there but um but they but they do remember it. Yes. You know? So, yeah, so, 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 so that, that was a big interruption. So then, when I finally did go to school and support my kids and be like an a independent person again, after, after all of that, that's where I wound up in the situation I told you of carrying like 50 tons. You know, yes. uh, that, that, so, and that's kind of what led me back to doing it all. Because, because when I saw that that guy, you know, my, wow. my whose first name was Anthony, I forgot his last name, Tony. So. But um, I, 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 I did this like amazing multimedia presentation, like it, like, <laughs> like an epic poem, and the uh, uh, and the. Um, paper, the documentation of burnout, photographs, music. Fabulous. Yeah, and, and that was like, okay, like I'm alive again, and now I yes. have this master's in social work, and I don't want to do it anymore. Ah, uh, Which I, I sacrificed that. to get, you know. Yeah, but you just dove into it again. Well, gradually. I mean, yes. I still had to live and so yes, you know. So that. I gradually started adding that in because once I wasn't in school again, once it sounds terrible. My my mother died while I was in graduate school. So yeah. okay, so here's one weight lifted. My son got clean. Yeah. I changed my job. I I actually told my my boss that it, I was just too stressed out. I couldn't take it, and he was just such a great person. He put me on unemployment and hired me as a consultant. Mm, that's a good He was just a fucking awesome yes. guy. Yes. You know, yes, and you. I worked there for a long time, so I, I, had earn, I had earned some consideration, which you usually never get. So this yes. guy was just a great guy. So, um, yeah. So then, um, the first thing I did when, when I left the job was I had this boyfriend who was an artist and I, I, I'm gonna just stop you yeah. there well then how did you start this life as a poet okay so this is gonna sound so corny yeah. like I had said I was never gonna I wasn't gonna write poetry anymore I said poetry is fucking stupid I want to get back to writing like short stories yeah. and that kind of thing and um, I was curious about MySpace, that was the social, because my kids were on and I was wondering what they were doing. Yes. And so I opened up a MySpace account knowing nothing and it turned out there was this incredible era of poetry going on. Mm. People who were still my friends, that publisher I was just talking to, that's how I met her. Mm. And, it, and, and I started writing again and people would, nope, uh-uh. 
people would would read it and um, you know we would comment and we actually be, came, got to know each other the guy who's going to edit my book that's how I met him oh that's great the New York and is that around the time of the I know it's still open but the New York and cafe the New York and poets cafe no when I first went there when it opened was 1974 mm -hmm. and we're talking mm -hmm. like 2000 something now mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't have my first shop book published. It was 2008. I mean, I couldn't imagine, couldn't have imagined having a book published. And so now I have five and working on ah. six. You know, so that first chat book, I was writing it, but I didn't know I was writing a book. I was writing these poems about East 10th Street. The book is called Belinda and Her Friends, and it was about living on 10th Street. And I was writing these poems that were kind of telling a story, like a narrative. And all of a sudden I realized I was writing a book. So when I had left this job, I had this artist boyfriend who wasn't terribly supportive of me because he was the artist. I wasn't the artist. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, that we, we got on his motorcycle and we, and, we, and we rode for like two months. And while I was doing this, I, we had our laptops. I was writing this book that I didn't know was a book. I love that. You started writing this book that you didn't know was a book, Correct. but it was a book. Became it. Oh, you were asking me how I got onto the poetry yes. thing and in terms of performance. And, well, yes. this, again, it sort of happened through social media. There was, I started, I was just watching what other people do and they would submit to, I never thought about being published. I never imagined I'd be published, but so other people were submitting to different journals and this and that and I started doing that a little and I started getting accepted. I'm not, I'm not talking to like, I wasn't accepted to New York Quarterly or the New Yorker magazine. I'm talking about independent yes. journals, but some of which are very legitimate and still exist today. And uh, arguably the first time I was published, it was like simultaneously. So it was by the Mamet, which still exists. And by another one out of California, I forgot, it starts with the C, but both hard copy journals, not like internet blogs. Yes, right. And, they, and, and the mom, and two, two wonderful women were running this, and they, <laughs> they generally would publish just one poem, but they took two of mine. Yes. And, and then they would have oh. the, two, uh, the, the release party, and they'd have it in two places, one in Brooklyn, one in Manhattan, and usually only read it once. And they asked me to read the post to them. Like, they were so supportive. And so I went to the first one, which was in Williamsburg, the place that no longer exists. And I remember I was sitting in my car. Talk about shaking. Yeah. Man, I... <laughs> the papers... I, you know, I had figured out a technique of how you can hold it so they don't know you're shaking, <laughs> you know. I, I was just terrified. And then when I read... Because I had done... The, an open mic at, at the New York Poets Cafe, in fact, and I didn't go over very well with it. Yes. Even though I had so many decades of history with them, it was like, and, and, and in my head, I'm like, I'm never doing this again. I'll write, you know, this is not for me. Yes. Being perform, performing. Now I like live on it for the stage, but yes. I try not to live for the stage because the stage is a trying up, but. The stage like, is what? A trying up. You know, oh, so, oh, oh. That's, that's a whole other story. But anyway. So I so by the the time I read the second one, which was the KGB book, I was much more relaxed. And yes. So it just kept going on, and I just kept visualizing different ways of performing, and different things that could happen, and they would happen. So now you wholeheartedly believe yourself to be the artist that you're acclaimed to be. You feel it. Well, I, I had to do the artist way along the way to get there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because I was talking to someone that I know is from a different part of my life, like the dog park. And I said, no, I have to meet this woman. So she's interviewing me. And she was like, why? Like, why? <laughs> you know, like, it just couldn't, like, sink in. Like, why? Like, <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> what part of Brooklyn are you from? Gravesend. Gravesend <gasps> slash Bensonhurst, like, not far from Oh, Miami. okay, because I'm from uh, Bay Ridge. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> I well, am. Well, this place I worked and I was telling you about was in Sunset Park. Ah! Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. my roots. So, what is the biggest challenge you feel you had in your life? In the past? Yeah. My or, biggest, well, my biggest, my, it's easy to actually to answer that. My, my, my biggest challenge was um, 
not believing what I had been told I am Ugh. all my life. You know what I mean? Like, I was trying to explain something to a friend. We were talking about that topic we all love so much, aging and women and looks. And, <laughs> you know, and she said, and she's an exceptionally physically beautiful woman. And she said that, she, and I find this a very prejudiced statement, that if you were someone who has not been that good looking, that it's easier to age. And I said, this is not true. Like, I know for a fact this is not true. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, you're beautiful. I said, you don't believe you were. I said, no, it's other people told me I was not. I was not the right shape for the time I grew up in. I'm always not, not in the right ear, you know? So I look at, like, I looked at photos later, the, the ones where I saw that I was so fat and I was just, because there was Twiggy, you know? And I'm like, no, I was fucking voluptuous at an early age and gorgeous. But I, at the time, you don't know that. Yes. Because you're not being told that by anyone. Yes. You know, so that... If you had the chance to be, let say, 27 again, what would you, what would you do different? 27? You mean like <laughs> the 27 club where I throw myself? <laughs> or at 30? Is there anything you'd do different? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing, the biggest, biggest, biggest thing that I would do differently was to not do drugs. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. And, you know, it's funny because sometimes people would say, yeah, but look at all the the art you've gotten out of the poetry I said I would fucking burn every poem to have not put my kids through that for one day yeah you know so that's that's the biggest thing that I, I would change in my life yeah yeah do you think one person one partner let's say can fulfill everything you need mm. uh -uh. impossible do you have open relationships if I had any, they'd be older. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you give a fuck about what other people think about you? So much, yeah. Still? Still. Interesting. I mean, in the... Exactly what I call it. In the milieu that we're in. Yes. You kind of have to. You're always, you're always being judged. You want to get a show? It depends what they think of you. What somebody thinks of me walking down the street or interacting, not so much, not so much. But yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, there's things I think about all the time that if I look like if I was younger and hotter, I'd get this or that. Like, you know, I'm, what I'm doing, I'm doing in a stage in my life where it's not in style to be doing what I'm doing. See, that's what I love. That yeah. is what I love. But most people don't. <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, so on, on that level, I, 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 the, I guess it's on a kind of superficial level because I get really, really hung up on like everybody gets cosmetic surgery but me even though my everybody is a small group of people compared to the entire country and I don't know if it's privileged shit but you know, I get, very, I get hung up on that kind of superficiality. Well, let me ask you something. I'm not sure if it is so superficial since we're talking about being able to eat and eat well. So what would be your ideal gig? Well, these gigs are, uh, we're not eating and eating well after these gigs anyway, like let's face it, you know, and quite a bit is there's too many people willing to work for free. Yes. There's too much out there, you know, like when I said I found like myself writing again through the internet, well, so did 50 billion other people, yes. you know. If anyone can cut a CD, anyone can self-publish a book, how do you sort through yes. any of it? So, I don't know. I mean, what would be like my dream gig? Yes. I, I would love it if we could, and I don't know who the... I don't know if it would be my four-piece band, my three-piece, any of us, you know, if we could open in some stadium of like a hundred thousand people Ooh. or something you know or, or whatever or even ten thousand but something that's so different than, than yes. what we do i would love to see an audience and and and, and possibly capture yes at least some of them what kind of music is it behind you since i didn't see you with it well again it's like that um, very iris 
why they'd ask me to do that. Yes. And then sometimes someone would step up and play with me, like, you know, an improvising sax player. Fun. And then one time there was a situation at the Bowery Electric. It was a benefit after Hurricane Sandy. And um, there was a gap, like someone had walked out. And my friend Jeff Wilson, who plays guitar with me, as a, more a side project, he has his own band, but Soul King. But he needed, um, he just did what he used to call an add water and stir band, like gather mm -hmm. everybody up. And he asked me to come up and do some poetry with him. Mm -hmm. And it was him, guitarist, bass, someone was on keyboard, someone was on drums, I remember that much. And afterwards we looked at each other and he said, I think we have something here. Uh. And we started improvising. It was me and him and I didn't have a drummer or a bass player. It was like the violinist, Walter Stenning and saxophonist Stanley Ray, you know, and, and then sometimes we would add people. It was, that's why it was called Puma Pro in France, because mm. we were just throwing stuff together, um, you know, for a couple of years. And then um, I, I kind of narrowed it down to a drummer, bassist, and a guitarist, and my friend Joe, who you saw with me there, Joe Stabnick, he started writing music to my poems. And oh, we started beautiful. writing songs. And we started trying to do certain songs the same way each time. And we actually started rehearsing. For 10, 11 years, we never rehearsed once. <laughs> so, yeah, so we started rehearsing, you know. And at the beginning, Jeff was like, why would we rehearse, you know? But he came around to seeing that this was another way of doing things, so. And as a result, you think you're better with this group because of rehearsing, because it's tighter? Well, yeah, it's different. Yeah. It's different. But when I do something, but then Joe and the drummer Dave Donan and I, we have a, a, a trio, an acoustic, more of an acoustic type trio, where we don't, we, we generally don't rehearse. We just play together to get the feel of it. Yes. So it's a little more, although Joe will still plays some of what he's written. It's a little more, so there are times when the improvisation happens also because if we just did the songs that we had written, we would only have like 22 songs or something. And we, I, like I changed the, I, I like to do new stuff, so I'll just, you know, like Jonathan, I used to, he used to tell me what's the first line of the poem. I give him the first line and he'd get an idea to play. Now they just ask me what kind of tempo, what's the mood, what's, you know, and I give him an idea and we go from there. and. It can work really amazingly well. It could work not as well. <laughs> but the stuff we've rehearsed would generally always work well. Yeah. So this is your life. This is what you do. Well, I try, but it's like I said, there's not as many. Before the pandemic, yes. we were really on an upswing. Yes. So many shows. You know, the last show before we did before the pandemic was at um, the Cafe Bohemia in the West Village, the Jazz Club. Yeah. Just fantastic, intimate performance where, I don't know, they, we, we filled every seat, whether it was 50 people, whatever it was, and it was such a beautiful show. Mm. Had two saxophonists, you know. Mm. And then the next show we had coming up was March 15th, which fortunately yeah. I canceled because probably someone would have died in that one because everybody who played that week you know, had somebody die in the audience. So we didn't do that one, and then there was this long break. Yeah. And then when we came back, I mean, I used to have a regular show with the Bowery Electric for eight years. Mm. Never got that show back. Um, the the Treehouse, which was the place we were supposed to play March 15th, they turned it into a VIP lounge that nobody goes to. Um, we hadn't, we just had this residency at Anyway Cafe for, throughout the whole pandemic until February when they lost their lease because they decided to, their lease ended and they chose to rent into a clothing store instead. Uh. So, we, you know, we, we play every couple of months at the 11th Street Bar, but that's one of the few places left. So, you know, there's a lot of competition to play there. So that's why a lot of the other things that I do, like we're gonna have a night at um, the Jefferson Market Library. Um, yeah. You know, the thing that I was at with, you know, where I met you, which yeah. I was like thrilled to do that. You know, yeah, this is great, you know. But Pandemic we really lost a lot, you know. Yes, We lost yes, a lot, yes. we had a momentum and we lost it. We never got it back.
when we play a show, we can be on a bill with a bunch of rock and roll bands. And we will hold our own. We're rock and roll enough, but we're different. And people will come up and say, that was great, that was great, that was great. But we're not the ones they're booking. Yes. Because their thinking is not out of the box. Their thinking is so, you have a front person, they sing, stop it. Uh-uh. You have a front person that sings. And maybe people get, even though we have been known to bring people to their feet to dance, but it's not, yes. you know, it, it's not what people are looking for now. Like if Patti Smith was starting now, I don't know how well she would do. And I'm not comparing myself to Patti, but I'm just saying, yeah. she she started at a great fucking time. So if you ask me if there's something else I would change besides not using drugs, it would have been starting when Patti started. It's not like I wasn't around. I'd been a little younger than a couple of years, but you know, I basically, same era. And, and what did she do? She went to the St. Mark's Church. Lenny went with her. He sat down with the guitar. And it all started there, you know? Yes. I did the same thing, but I did it too late. Yes, I hear you. When do you think you got the confidence that you have now? You have a lot of confidence. Well, when you said when? Yeah, I mean, you can't pinpoint. No, somebody. no, no. But when we were talking about Patti Smith, was it a... A, a, a long time coming that you became as confident as you are? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you when or how, but it's, you know, but when wait. you do, like, like when you're doing something, and if, if you're doing it well, yes. if you're engaging that crowd, you know, mm. you know it. it. New York for you. Why New York? Why New York? Oh, because I'm too lazy to go anywhere else. <laughs> and, and really. It's such an effort. I, I'm always fascinated by people who pick themselves up and move. Me too. I don't think I'm that adventurous, to tell you the truth. I mean, and, and, and if you're in New York and you have affordable housing, it's what I said before, like real estate kills romance, kills adventure, it kills everything. Like, where am I going now? You know, I have a very small family, two grown kids. I'm not going to go live, like, on the other... Not that I'm clinging with my kids, but I'm not going to go live on the other side of the world, you know? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, maybe it's different if you do it with a partner, I don't know. Do but your kids get you what you do? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> Are they artist types? Um, in their own ways, mm -mm -mm. you know, like my, my daughter, it's funny because when she was in high school, she announced to me that she was either gonna get on the poetry circuit by August, so she was joining the Marines, and I'm like, fuck, you know, I wasn't doing poetry at that moment, but, and I'm like, you know, another, her father was Puerto Rican, so it's like another child of color actually thinks the armed forces will change her life, because her reasoning was that I, she knows I can't afford to send her to a really great college, and she's sort of screwed up in her five high schools, so... You know, you know, the Marines would give her this, um, would send her through school when she, you know, she believed the crap. Fortunately, she got on the poetry circuit because she knew where to go. She went right to the New York Poets Cafe because her uncle started it. My kids were in that cafe when they were like, before they walked. So, you know, she knew where to go. But then she, it wasn't something she decided to pursue. But, so she works as, um, Although she she was part of that scene for a while, she hosted slams and the open room. But um, her job, she works at the new school at a high school within the new school that is for kids of color who want to be artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she has a lot of artistic interests. Yeah, like she did graduate with a degree in filmmaking, but ultimately didn't pursue that. But you know, she takes she can take any class at the new school. She so she takes photography and. She gets like all the, 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 they have great perks, like you can buy art projects, she's always making shit, you know. So, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. My son is more, my son was a DJ, like I said, he loves me, my son is just scary fucking smart, <laughs> you know, yeah. Let's talk about libido. Has your libido changed? Yeah, over the last year or two. I think the pandemic killed that too. Ugh. Yeah, I really feel like it did. I, I became, I did have, I'm not going to call it a person of partner, I did have a person of interest, that, yes. which is not like the person who murdered someone. And 
I don't know. I just lost interest. Mm. It's not coming back. The spark is not mm. like sparks that I feel with people are just so fleeting, and if it's not really convenient, I'm really not pursuing it. Yes. Like I'm really not going that out of my way for it. Yes. I, mean, I look at you, and I'm thinking this woman's living a full life. Do you agree? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? Well, even though I said that the, you know, the libido or the sparks are not there, that I think with it, there is missing a partner, mm. you know, and I mm -mm. think that when you die, the most important thing you leave behind is love. Yes. So even if, so, whatever kind of love that that is, if you don't have that, where where you know, someone loves you like maybe a little more than they love other people. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's sort of that general stuff. So, no, that's not a full life. And I, think, you know, and I think not really having a lot of money. You know, unfortunately. You could do a lot more, you know. Like, like I, like I hate the heat, and you know, I feel like stuck here. Yes. You know? So, that, so there are many ways where I don't feel it. Like, it's funny how other, you know, other people have a different yes. image of, of 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 you, but without knowing very much. Yeah, because. What you're giving out is full, full and rich. Just being honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't even like even saying all of this because, you know, you don't want you don't you no. don't really want to expose your your Achilles heels. Except that's what your poetry and, does. Well, if it did it that well, you wouldn't have to ask me. Ah, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't on video. <laughs> so, what was your favorite time in terms of the decades? For you. In terms of what? The decades. Like, was it the 80s? Was it... Well, not the 80s. I guess I, I liked um, the late 60s to late 70s. Mm. Mm -mm. You know, not the 60s or the 70s, but no, that. No, I understand. Because you, know, yeah. you were out there. Yeah, there was cool music. There was... Oh, it was fun. Yes. And you were making music then. I was what? Were you, uh, were you performing poetry then in the beginning? Uh, I might have done a little bit. It wasn't. A, yes. I, yeah, I did a little bit of a lot of things. You know, but it was just it was fun. 